you, when, when you start talking about eschatology, it can get tense for some people. But I promise you that you're going to hear some good news. How many would like to hear some good news concerning some of this? And, uh, you know, let, let me say it like this. Let me just kind of get uh, introduce it like this. Somebody asked me recently, a matter of fact, a major Ph.D. guy that's really respected in this field has been a consultant when Larry King Live was on, on this subject, said to me, why are you having so much success teaching this? And I said, he said, because I've been rejected a lot by teaching this. I said, because I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm trying to present truth that people can decide whether they want to believe it or not. And I kind of teach it like this, kind of like the news. I'll report, you decide. Is that fair enough? And we'll look into the scriptures and we'll see some things. Now, I really do think that sometimes truth can make you mad before it makes you free. Anybody ever had something that you heard that was like, okay, that just really kind of made me a little bit, uh, and then you start really thinking about it. And much of some of the things that I'm going to share, I actually tried not to see because it would make me a whole lot popular if I could see it the way some of them see it. But uh, uh, I guess I'm, 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 I'm giving too many disclaimers here at the beginning. But uh, I, let me just tell you about my journey. We're going to start in the scriptures, and I've given them a list of scriptures tonight. But let me just tell you about my journey. I, I was telling Pastor Lubby in the, uh, in the uh, green room back there that I really began to question a lot of things when I was 16 years old. I turned 65 today, by the way. And I was thinking, I probably started coming here when I was in my late 30s or early 40s. And really what connected me to Pastor Barry especially was our uh, same views over eschatology. I knew it was a passion for him, it was a passion for me. And we played a lot of golf and we'd talk about these kind of things and share things. And then, you know, um, we, we started coming here and uh, teaching and ministering and just build a relationship with his family. This is kind of like home to me. So I kind of feel like I'm at home here and I do appreciate the opportunity. This really is a subject that I really get excited about. I love teaching this. I have been for the last several years meeting in private with leaders all over the country. Some of them are heads of entire organizations and meeting with them in private. And two years ago, I felt like the Lord said, okay, it's time to take it to a more bigger audience. And so we started doing events and we did one in Birmingham last year and we just finished one in uh, near Kansas City last uh, or the first of, of October. And uh, ministry and people from everywhere beginning to come and ask some questions and take a look at some things in a fresh way. And let me just tell you something. I think that what we're going to see is that God is a whole lot bigger than we thought he was. Would that offend you if God was bigger than you thought he was? If he got a whole lot more victorious than you dreamed he could possibly be? What if I tell you we win? Hallelujah. Let, let's get on this journey a little bit because there's a lot of stuff to cover, and I'm going to be more meticulous to teach. This is going to be a seminar style, and I might, you know, I might get excited after a while and rear back and preach for a couple of seconds, but I really want to kind of meticulously go through some things so that you can kind of follow along and think for yourself. Like I said, when I was 16, I used to sit in churches. And in those days, there was a lot of fear being taught. And I can remember the videos and the stuff from, like, uh, you know, that they would show us in church. And, man, I can remember going home, Pastor Lubby, and literally crying myself to sleep for fear. And I would go, and I was a young Christian, and so, uh, you know, I, I would go home, and I thought to myself, uh, as I said in many of those meetings, I would think, something about this is not right. I don't know what is right, but I know this isn't. So I started asking questions, and then I would ask questions, and then I'd start to get some answers. And then at that time, I would go to my pastor, and I would say, well, what about this? And he'd say, be careful, now you're getting deceived. And I'm thinking, well, that's why I'm asking you. And I'm like, okay, you know, but what, what about this? And what I discovered after a little while is he didn't know himself. Now, let me just say that when I teach this, I don't try to attack other people's views or I don't try to attack other ways of seeing these because I believe everybody does the best they can with what they know. But what happens is, is when we start to get, I believe we are in a day when God is about to do something that's way bigger than revival. 
Now, I, I, I'm not opposed to revival, but I believe we're in a, a, one of the most massive reformations of human history, and it's time for us not to play on the sidelines. We're either going to have to get on board with God's purpose and God's plan, or we're going to have to get out of the way. That's all there is to it. And I believe that God's plan is new creation, and it's an ongoing uh, uh, plan that he has. But let me just tell you some of the things that, first of all, begin to uh, make me think. If you turn with me in your Bible, and if, they, they have the, if the media team has some of the stuff I sent you, the first scripture is Hebrews chapter 1. Verse number 1 and 2 was one of the first things that began to catch my attention. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, say this with me, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. How many know Jesus is going to get his inheritance? He's the heir of all things by whom also he made the world. And so let me just say this, because I have to stress this point. Context and audience relevance is everything. A text out of context is just a con. And we've had a lot of text out of context. Paul is writing to Hebrews. How do I know that? It's the title of the book. He's writing to first century Hebrews in about 66 to 67 AD. They are 30 some years into the New Testament, or into the New Covenant, I'm sorry, into the New Covenant. Jesus was crucified about 30 some years prior to this, and they are in this great transition out of an old covenant and into the New Covenant. And the whole book of Hebrews is about what is better about the New Covenant than the old one. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than Levi. There's a better tabernacle. There's better blood. There's better promises. There's better faith. There's a better city. It's all right to say amen. It, 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 everything about it, he's showing you what's better about the new covenant. But what I want you to see is that this apostle, this caught my attention, because what we do is we go to these scriptures with preconceived ideas and we read the scripture, God hath in these last days spoken to us by the Son. And immediately we take our mind to 2022 of the events that we saw on the news this afternoon, and we say, boy, this is the last days, except this apostle wasn't talking to us. See, it's too awful quiet in here for me. He was talking to first century Hebrews, and Paul, if that's who the writer is, and I, just for the assumption here, it's either him or Barnabas probably, but he's saying to his audience, God has, in these last days, spoken to us by the Son, whom he hath made heir of all things. So here's, here's the first thing that caught my attention is, this apostle believed he was living in the last days of something. If you think that's fair, say amen. So he was, he was declaring God had, and that's, not, that's past tense, that's not something he's going to do. That's something he's already done. So I thought to myself, well, Paul was beat a lot. He was let down over walls and baskets. He was spent a lot of time in Roman jails. He was shipwrecked, snake bit, perils of the sea, perils of most false brethren. And I thought, well, maybe this guy was just beat so much he just thought he was living in the last days. And that's what some prophecy teachers will tell you is that these guys believed they were living in the last days. And everybody has to believe they're living in the last days. To which I reply, if they believed they were living in the last days and they were wrong about that, what else were they wrong about? Let's suppose they were not wrong at all. Let's suppose, as the Scripture is saying, let's use Scripture and compare Scripture with Scripture and, and consider the possibility that they were in fact living in the last days of something. Let me just let me just let me say this to you. This is kind of a, a boom statement, but but what over the next couple of days, and I really hope you can be in every one of these things because I'm going to pack a lot of information in this, and there's no way I can exhaust this subject anyway. But when, when these guys were standing here believing that they were living in the last days, let me just say this to you. Everything that you probably have been taught about end time stuff and last days, stay with me a minute, everything you've been taught about the last days is probably right, except that you have the end at the wrong spot.
And this is what to me was a game changer is when I started saying this was the last days. But it was not the last days of a cosmic collapse or a global calamity. It was the last days of an old covenant. God was about to give birth to a new covenant. So I thought to myself, well, here's Paul. Maybe he was beat a lot, let down over baskets. Let's see if we could find any more apostolic witnesses that would say the same thing. So then I went to Acts chapter 2. These were scriptures that really begin to make me think. And that's what I want to do tonight primarily. Acts chapter 2, verse number 16. The Holy Spirit had just been poured out. God began to uh, uh, pour out His Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. God was uh, giving them the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, He told them uh, just 50 days prior to this in an upper room when they ate the Passover, He said to them, go to the upper room and in 50 days exactly, which was the Feast of Pentecost, there's going to come the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. They are, they're, they're, they're all talk, talking in tongues. They are speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit has just been poured out. They're receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2. And he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So here we have the second apostolic witness. Here's the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, and he's saying, this is that. This isn't what's going to happen when there's a revival in Pensacola or Toronto. I'm not opposed to any of those revivals. But that's not what Peter was hanging his last day scriptures on. He was saying, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last day, saith God, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. How many know that's not what he was going to do in the future? That was what was happening on the day of Pentecost. How many know that wasn't, this is what's going to be? He said, this is that. And how many know that with the this is that came the coming of the kingdom and they were waiting on the kingdom to come. Help me, Holy Ghost. See, I'm trying to preach a little bit here and I really want to kind of stay calm. But when John the Baptist preached, he said, repent, change the way you think because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is within your grasp. It's within your reach. And at that moment, the king of the kingdom walked down over the bank of the Jordan River and he said, behold, right there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How many of the king of the kingdom just came on the scene? And from that time on, Jesus began to preach the kingdom, said the kingdom is at hand. He said, every time I cast out a devil, every time I heal the sick, every time I raise the dead, then the the kingdom of God is come unto you. Come on, somebody. How many of we're not waiting on some kingdom way out there somewhere? We need to learn that there's some things. See, what's going to happen is through this uh, victorious eschatology, we're going to realize that there's a lot of stuff we've been waiting for some glad morning that we ought to be having right now. See, a procrastinator is somebody who won't take now for an answer. Hallelujah. Now, how many know that the prophet Isaiah also spoke spoke concerning these people? He said, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people, yet they will not hear me. And how many know he was talking that this was the sign that would come to unbelievers, but not just unbelieving Gentiles, but unbelieving Jews who were about to miss their Messiah and their king, that this was a sign to them that the kingdom was now coming in power because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy, it's located in the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost just came, come on, how many know the kingdom was birthed and underway and the church was now on its way to its purpose and its destiny. And Peter stood up and said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days saith God, I'm going to pour out my spirit. He called his day the last days. Here's two apostles who are not calling something way out in the future the last days. He's calling what was happening in the first century the last days because it was the last days again, not of a global collapse or a cosmic collapse. It was the last days of the old covenant. Are you tracking with me? And so when I begin to see that, I've had people challenge me. The first time I ever taught this was probably, I don't know, probably at least 20-something years ago. I was in Temecula, California, and I titled this Gone with the Wind. Because there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. How many know in the Old Testament the wind came and the Red Sea was opened? And they crossed over. You know what's amazing to me? 
is that was they, they left Egypt delivered by the blood at Passover. Say Passover. They came to the bank of the Red Sea. They crossed the Red Sea, and they came to the foot of Mount Sinai exactly 50 days after the Passover. And, and see, 50, the reason the, the, the Pentecost is called the day of Pentecost is because the word Pentecost itself means 50, because the Feast of Pentecost came exactly 50 days after the Passover. Now watch this. In the Old Testament, they left delivered by the blood of a spotless lamb. They came through the Red Sea. They're at the foot of Mount Sinai. God comes down on the cloud, wants to make a whole nation a priest out of the people. The people forfeit a personal relationship with God for a mediator system. And so God gives them rules because if you don't have a relationship, you've got to have rules. But the moment God gave the law at the foot of Mount Sinai, exactly 50 days after Passover, 3,000 people dropped dead. In the new covenant, the night before his decease, Jesus takes the bread and says, with great desire have I desired to eat this Passover. Why? Because there's another exodus about to take place here. The real lamb of God was on the scene, and this is the last time they'd ever have to kill a woolly lamb. And exactly 50 days after Jesus is crucified, they're in this upper room. And this time the wind comes not to cross the Red Sea, but the wind comes, come on, to divide the old covenant from the new covenant. They cross over. God gives them the Holy Spirit. And this time... 3,000 are added to the church. Under the old covenant, the letter killed, 3,000 people dropped dead. In the new covenant, 3,000 are added to the church. Why? Because under the old covenant, the letter kills. In the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. It was the last days of an old covenant. The kingdom was now coming on the scene with power. Help me, Holy Ghost. I feel this, I feel this stuff in my bones. We've got a whole lot more potential than we think we do. And then he was demanded of the scribes and Pharisees in John, um, uh, Luke chapter 17. When will the kingdom come? He didn't say, Lord, when are we going to the kingdom? He said, when will the kingdom come? And he said, the kingdom does not come with your careful observations. What he's saying there is not that you can't see it. What he's saying is it doesn't come to the observances of old covenant rituals because the word observation there is the same Greek word that's used in the book of Galatians where he says, I'm afraid of you, Galatians, because you have gone back up under the law, touch not, taste not, handle not, and you observe laws and feasts and months. In other words, you think the kingdom's coming through the observation of old covenant rituals, but that didn't produce the kingdom. The Holy Ghost is the only thing that can produce the kingdom. What we need right now all over the world is a good dose of people filled with the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, who are kingdom subjects that, that know that there's a plan and a purpose for the church in the earth right now. And so God gives us a big case full of power tools to use to do exactly that, I think sometimes I'm going to come to church with a big box full of power tools and say, you know, we're like Tim the tool man. We got all these t tools. We don't know how to use them. They're called gifts of the Spirit. And we don't know how to use them. Now, that's the second apostolic witness. Here's the third one. First John chapter 2. I don't want to belabor each one of these points, but I do want to kind of at least establish some scriptures here that make you at least think. First John chapter 2 verse 18. It said, little children... 1 John 2, 18, if you're taking notes, I think they're bringing them up on the screen. Little children, it is the last time. Now, how many know John is not writing to us? He's writing to people in the first century. Little children, it is the last time. And if you have heard, Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, here's three apostles. Paul says, God hath in these last days... Called his day the last days. Here's Peter standing on the day of Pentecost. This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith God, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then we have the apostle John, three apostles that walked with Jesus. Paul didn't, but he, he saw the Lord. But here's John, the apostle, and he says, we, we know, we don't think it is. It's not an assumption for us. We know that it is the last time. Because Antichrist is already on the scene. And I've said it like this all over the world. That was before Osama, Obama, Chelsea's mama, or the last Trump. Because ever since I've been this high, I can tell you at least a dozen different antichrists. Some of you aren't even old enough to remember some of the antichrists I've been through. I, got, I saw somebody with a shirt on that I thought, i got to get me one of these. It says, I have survived at least 10 end-of-the-world scenarios. <laughs> And after they 
the prophecies fail over and over and over again, and they go, whoops, saith the Lord, but we're going to write another book. I say this, at least consider the possibility that there may be another way to look at this. And I don't want to go straight for the juggler here tonight, but do you know, most of us never... I, when I started studying and looking in the Word of God and just thought, I believe what I believe because that's what everybody else believed, that's what I was taught, and there was no other views to this stuff. Started finding out that most of our dispensational pre-tribulation rapture theory is only a couple hundred years old. And it is the newest uh, version of eschatology. As a matter of fact, I believe it was Augustus who said in 300 at about one of the main councils, he said, we will put the book of Revelation in the canon of Scripture as long as we never preach it as something that's futuristic. Now stay with me. I know I'm going to make you real nervous. But I'm going to show you a lot of proofs. So like I said, I'll report. You decide. And if you leave here and say, I think this guy's crazy. We'll still be friends and we don't have... You, you, you. Is that cool? Because what we believe about eschatology doesn't depend on whether or not we get to go to heaven. What it does do is change what we're about to do in the earth. What it does is change how we deal with where we're living. At. And, and, and you say, well, it's not important. It's so important that it's almost in every piece of Scripture through the Word of God. And once you get the pieces, all these Scriptures that didn't make sense before, all of a sudden they'll start to fit together. And I hope that's what happens when we hit some of this, what I call, aha stage. Like, well, that fits, that fits, that fits, without any stretching it or any kind of manipulation, but using good biblical, just reading what the writer said. These three writers all believed they were living in the last days of something. Can you say amen to that? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 7, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch under prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me, uh, uh, if you have one of the charts that have the, uh, the ends of the ages charts, is it possible to bring it up before too awful long here? Do you have the, the one with the two circles uh, and the media team? We're going we're gonna to need that as I start to read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now here's Paul writing to, again, he's writing to the first century church at Corinth. Again, remember, the Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. Well, let me try it on this side. In other words, there's truth that is absolutely perpetual, but when he writes a letter to the church at Corinth, he's, it's going to have some relevance to the church at Corinth. If I wrote a letter to seven churches which are in Asia, the letter I wrote are going to have some relevance to seven churches that are in Asia. The fact that some of these battles in the book of Revelation are fought with horses ought to tell you this is first century stuff. And I'll get there in a moment, but Revelation, one of the things it says in the book of Revelation is these things are about to shortly come to pass. Somebody said, well, you know, that's because with God, time is, you know, doesn't matter. Well, if I tell you, I'm, hallelujah. If I tell you, Gavin, go get the car ready. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming very shortly. In 2022 years from now, I hadn't showed up yet. Number one, I didn't live long enough. I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm just trying to get us to think about some of these things. That these guys meant what they said, and they said what they meant, and they were talking about some things that was imminent in the first century. We've got to at least consider the possibilities that these guys really were talking about the end of something. And we're going to get, we're going to get more specific as we get into this. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 1, uh, uh, 1 through 11. I don't have this. Actually, I don't have this printed out on mine. Can you bring that up for me? Hallelujah. Can, can you go up to verse 1? I know I didn't give you all of this, but let me, let me just go ahead and read the context of this. If, is it possible? Go to verse 1 and then come down through 11. Are we good? You're still not too nervous? Say, I love you, Brother Lynn. What? I didn't hear. Happy birthday. <laughs> Moreover, the brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. 
Next verse. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All did eat the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from that drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. But let us, nor let us, uh, let us act immorally as some of them did, and, and 23,000 fell in one day. Next verse. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the serpents. Next verse. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our admonition or our instruction upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages have come. Does anybody have, a, anybody have King James Bible with you? Anybody in the room? Would you read that scripture for me uh, and read it, read it loud enough that I can hear it? It said, now these things happen to them. Bring that scripture back up and keep it on the screen just for a moment, if you could. I don't want, I want you to see this. This is powerful to me. Now all these things happened as an example, and they are written for our admonition. You have the King James, my friend? Eleven? Watch this. The original King James, this is a game changer to me. The original King James says, these things are written for our admonition, and they were written for us upon... Watch this. Read it for me again. They happened as examples, and they were written for our admonition. Now, he's talking to a first century church at Corinth. Uh, go ahead. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Do you see this word in King James? Upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the moment we think into the world, we're thinking in terms of a global collapse. Except that the Greek word here for world, and in many places in the King James, is mistranslated. The word that would be used as a globe or cosmos is actually the Greek word that you see translated correctly in this one, and even New King James. Go home and look it up. It's the Greek word eon. So it was not the end of the world as in a global collapse. It was the end of the ages. That's a game changer. Why is that? Because when we're talking, there's a difference between the end of the world and the end of the age. And what's really cool is when you start seeing a lot of the places where this word has been used and mistranslated. It starts to shift you to say, okay, it was the end. It's, what he says here is they were the people. He's talking to a first century church at Corinth. And he said everything that happened to them under Moses was an example for us. Not us, them. Now we can get the examples ourselves, but stay with me. Upon whom the, he's telling them the ends. If you're going to stay, if you're going to use the end of the world scenario, the end of the world came to the first century church at Corinth. Well, I'm going to try it over here. But when you see it wasn't the end of the world, it was the end of the age. You have to say the end of what age? And then you start putting some scripture together and you start realizing, wait a minute, maybe the last days of what he was talking about was not the last days of the world or the globe, but the last days of the Mosaic age. And maybe what we might consider the possibility of doing in this conference is losing our last day mentality and get a new day mentality and start to realize we have come out of some stuff and it's time for us to start going into our promise. Because the pattern here is that everything that happened to them under Moses was an example to get them to make the transition. If you could bring up those, could you bring up those two circles now? And let me just kind of uh, show you, these are powerful truths. Am I making sense so far? Are we good? Uh, if you could bring up the, the chart with the two circles, is that possible? I, it's hard for me to see you shake. There we go. If you could look at this, see, uh, uh, the way I like to, uh, 
that, that, that's a really good graphic. That, that first circle is the Old Covenant Age. And the second circle is the Old Covenant Age. Where these two circles converge was where most of the New Testament was written. And, and, and what's amazing to me is, ah, help me, Holy Ghost, I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus gave the prophecy in Matthew 24 and said, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world is not the same word again as world globe, but what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And that was a game changer for me because I started to say, wait a minute. He's not talking about this planet blowing up. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle writes in the book of Ephesians, and he says, to him be glory in the churches throughout all generations, world without end. Wouldn't it be some incredibly good news if this thing don't have to fall apart? As a matter of fact, I am afraid that a lot of our prophecies are self-fulfilling because we feel like we need to make them come to pass. But when you start to preach something that might actually give your children and your grandchildren back their future, people look at you like, what rock did you crawl out from underneath of? Well, I'm telling you, I'd rather preach a message of hope and victory than I would doom and despair. Even when he walked down into the valley of dry bones, he didn't say prophesy how dead they are. Beat them up for their stinkingness. Tell them their bones are all dry. He didn't say get beat them up ever. He said prophesy to the wind. Start to prophesy something positive. Tell them to live. Tell them to get up on their feed and exceed. you got to start to prophesy something that will make the church become essential again. Because if you think this thing is going to fall apart, you are not going to brass, you are not going to polish the brass on a sinking ship. Well, you say, well, Brother House, there's a lot of real problems in our world. I don't have my head in the sand. I know that. But I also know that the answer to it is not a few miles uh, east of here. I know that the answer to it might be sitting in this room in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ across the nations of the earth and the kingdom of God that is the salt and the light and that God's creation is an ongoing project of bringing about redemption and new creation and that that's how this thing ends is it ends with God winning. I don't know why that would be bad news to anyone. Anybody. Hallelujah. And I'm going to look at all the prophetic stuff and show you uh, without any kind of twisting it that it, it, it's so powerfully there that what he's talking about here is not the end of the world global, but the end of an age. But when you read it in King James, your mind goes, well, that's talking about the end of the world. We know the end of the world is very near. And he, see, Paul told them that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You're the people of whom, whom the ends of the world have now come. Now here's what I want you to show. He, 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 bring that chart back up again. Because he says the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, have come. You are the people upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages have now come. If you see this, see the front end of this old covenant age right there, and the back end of that new covenant age is where they overlap. The back end is the old covenant age. The front end is the new covenant. Hence the ends of the ages. Oh, I get so excited about this. And amazingly enough, Jesus gave the prophecy in Matthew 24 when he talked about what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world, King James. Read it in any other translation or look it up in any Greek lexicon, and it will tell you that it's not the word for globe. It is the word for age. And when I saw was talking about the end of the age, I begin to understand that he's not talking about a global collapse again, but he's saying the, the end of the age. And Jesus gave that prophecy concerning tribulation, deliver you up to be killed, uh, war, famine, Jerusalem encompassed with armies. I'll get into all of these time texts in just a moment. But when Jesus gave that prophecy, he gave that prophecy in 30 A.D., and he's prophesying concerning the destruction of the temple and the whole removal because the temple was the centerpiece 
of old covenant Judaism. Without that, you cannot have animal sacrifice. You cannot go back under the law if you wanted to. And Jesus said, I'm telling you, he's standing in front of the beautiful buildings of the temple, and he's saying to them, do you see all of these things? And he's pointing at the temple. And he said, not one stone will be left on another that will not be thrown down. Jesus gave the prophecies of Matthew 24 in 30 AD. And exactly 40 years later, right in the two, between those two circles, exactly 40 years later, the temple was destroyed. Zion was like a plowed field. Old Jerusalem was moved off the scene, and I'm going to say it blunt, and then I'll qualify more of this as we go. Old Jerusalem passed off the scene, and New Jerusalem came on the scene. An old temple was destroyed. Come on, somebody. And a new temple showed up. What? Do you not know your body's the temple? God moved out of that building and moved into this one. And what is amazing is, is that from the time he gave that prophecy until it came to pass was exactly 40 years, the same amount of time as the wilderness journey. And he's telling them that everything that happened to them happened as an example for you upon whom the ends of the ages have now come. And so Jesus comes on the scene and repeats almost everything in the book of Exodus because when John the Baptist says, there's the Lamb of God, he's telling you, there's another Exodus afoot here. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appear to him, and Moses, who is the mediator of the Old Covenant, says to Jesus, the Bible says, he spoke to him concerning his decease. Moses, the leader of the first Exodus, is talking to Jesus, the leader of the real Exodus, Concerning his decease, but the Greek word for decease there is exodus. So the leader of the first exodus said, I brought him out of a physical bondage, but you're about to bring him out of a spiritual bondage. There's another exodus about to take place here. I could go through a whole bunch of stuff here, but I could show you also the night before his decease. Jesus said, with great desire, have I desired to eat this Passover with you? Because he knew this is the last time they would ever kill a woolly lamb. And this time they were going to leave another kind of a bondage and enter into a different kind of a promised land. And when they had the Passover that night, it signaled that was the end of the bondage that they were in. Now, I'm so full, I hardly know where to put all these pieces together. But I could tell you this in Revelation chapter 11. uh, I believe it is around somewhere around verse uh, uh, 7. I think it is maybe maybe 8 in there. It says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. I mean, our Lord was not crucified in Sodom and Egypt. Our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. But Revelation 11 said our Lord was crucified in the city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So the Holy Spirit is taking his finger and said, you think the bondage that you were under Pharaoh was a bondage. The bondage I'm about to bring you up out of is the bondage of an old covenant system that made a slave out of you instead of a son. Come on, somebody. And we're about to make an exodus because I'm going to bring you out. It is the last days of an old covenant, and we are coming out of it, and we are coming into a promised land, so much so that everything that Jesus did all through the Scriptures, he starts saying, you remember, hallelujah, how Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's talking about another exodus. They crossed, come on somebody, hallelujah. A lot of stuff... I mean, I feel I feel like tra- trying to teach and preach here today. There's a whole chapter back there in my newest book called, it, called The Great I Am that has this in there. It, it's not an accident that in John's gospel, watch this. Jesus just leaves the feast of Passover. Say Passover. Exodus. See, it makes you think about it. He left the feast of Passover. They crossed the Sea of Tiberias, and there's a multitude in the wilderness, and they're hungry. I've seen this movie before. If I was a Jewish boy standing there, I'm thinking, wait a minute. We just left the feast of Passover. We just crossed the sea, and there's a multitude in the wilderness. And they're hungry, 
And he's about to feed a multitude in the wilderness. Takes me clear back to the book of Exodus. And he says to Philip, comes to him, says, Lord, you need to send him away. So they can go get bread to eat. And Jesus said, wait a minute, you feed him. Because he himself knew what he would do. The reason he knew what he would do is because this is not the first time he ever fed a multitude in the wilderness after they left the Passover. So he feeds 5,000 with, with five loaves and two small fishes. And when he gets it gathered back up, they come to him and said, what sign do you show us that you're the, you're the Messiah? I'm like, I might have been Jesus. I don't know what to do for you people. What sign do you show us? I just repeated the wilderness. And then Jesus quotes the scripture. He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. But I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. In other words, there's another exodus. There's another bread. There's another rock that was smitten. There's another serpent on the pole. I'm what that was pointing to. But this time I want to bring you out of the bondage of an old covenant paradigm and into the kingdom and into the new covenant. Calm down, Lynn. Where there's power and relationship and, and a restored priesthood where everybody has access to God without a mediator. That there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And we were on our way. How many know that 40 years from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. was a perfect picture of a wilderness journey? They were coming out and it was coming to an end in 70 A.D. But it's exactly 40 years upon whom the ends of the ages and everything they saw under Moses as an example, God gave them the same pictures again, so they ought to, should, should, they should have figured this thing out, man. Are you tracking with me? Am I making sense? And then you come clear over in the book of Revelation, he's writing to seven churches which are in Asia. And there are seven churches. But when you get past the third chapter, the word church is never mentioned again. Here's what most prophecy teachers tell you. Well, that's because the rapture took place somewhere between chapter 3 and chapter 4. To which I reply, if it was that important of an event, you'd have thought God would have put it in somebody's footnotes. <laughs> Why isn't the church mentioned after chapter 4 of the book of Revelation? Watch this. Because the very last church, he says, I'm standing at the door and knocking, and if you can hear my voice and open to me, I'll come in and sup with you. He's talking about eating the covenant meal, the Passover meal. We're coming out of something. Because the first usage of the word church here in the Bible is when God called the children of Israel. He said called them the church in the wilderness because the word church means the called out ones. And the reason that they're not mentioned again after the fourth chapter is because they're no longer in the wilderness. They haven't came out because when the fourth chapter of Revelation opened, he said, I looked and behold, a door was opened. Hallelujah. And there's a rainbow around about the throne in sight like a new emerald. It's a picture of the throne, the kingdom of God, with the rainbow as a symbol of the new covenant. They have left the wilderness and they've come into the kingdom. Now the church has become relevant. It's the vehicle by which God can do. I'm not saying we're doing away with the corporate gathering by any stretch of the imagination or the church. I'm just saying at some point we got to stop coming out and start going into something. I think we have to shift from a coming out mentality to a going in mentality. And I hope this seminar helps us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we start to see that, that they were the people upon whom the ends of the ages had now come, he was writing to them to encourage them that they were the people. Now let me just say this to you. We're going to go to Matthew 24 here in just a moment. But uh, before I get there, he's talking to them about uh, uh, the people upon whom the ends of the ages had now come. Once again, this word is not the ends of the world. But the end of the ages, that's a game changer to me. Because it makes a whole lot, uh, the meaning of it's completely different when you see the proper translation. How many words change over time? The translators do the best they can with what they have, but how many words, words, words change? If, if you think words don't change, I was thinking the other day, we were singing a carol, not the other day, last year, singing a Christmas carol. Don we now our gay apparel. I mean, that meant something different back then. <laughs> Words <laughs> change in their meaning. So while they may have thought world as in sense of a 
time period, the translators finally get it right and translate it as ages. Let me say this to you. When Jesus gave this prophecy in Matthew 24, one of the things that they use in liberal colleges to dismantle the faith of our children is they say, and even C.S. Lewis, who was one of the most respected theologians, and I respect C.S. Lewis, but his comments concerning Matthew 24 is this. He said, Matthew 24 is one of the greatest exhibitions, one of the most embarrassing exhibitions of error in the Scriptures because Jesus said he would come before that generation came to an end and he didn't show up. Therefore, College, uh, liberal college teachers tell us, see, so Jesus couldn't really be legit because it didn't come to pass like he said it did. Let me tell you, it came to pass exactly like he said it did. It's just that their interpretation of it is a whole lot different. And when you think Jesus made an error, you need to readjust your theology. See, we can, we can, we can talk about, well, you know, these apostles thought they were living in the last days, but, and they weren't. And they thought they were living in the last days, and they weren't. But you see, if we're, going to, if we're going to believe the Scriptures, we have to take what these men are saying and believe if they said they were living in the last days, they were living in the last days. You're awful quiet on me, but I think that's some pretty good news, actually. Now, let's look at a few more thoughts here for, before we uh, uh, kind of come to... i got plenty of time yet to share some of this. Go with me to Matthew 23. Let's go to 23 first, and then we'll come up to Matthew 24. I want to go to verse 34. <clears throat> Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel under the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, watch this, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Everybody say this generation. Let me be slow and meticulous. He's not talking about us. He was talking about them. He's prophesying woes to that first century audience that's standing in front of them. He said that you killed the prophets, you stoned them that are sent to you. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, it quotes this again when the city is about to be destroyed, that he calls great Babylon the great harlot, and he says that in her was found the blood of all the martyrs. The only city that Jesus makes that indictment against is Jerusalem. And he says to them, upon you will come the blood of all from the blood of Zacharias and Barakash you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you that all of these things will come upon this generation. Everybody say this generation. How many can see he's talking about that group right there? You've got to see context because I want to show you some other stuff in here. And then he goes on to say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to thee, how oft I would have gathered you your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not, wherefore your house is left to you desolate. Now let me say this to you. The only place God has wings is on the mercy seat. What he's saying to them is, I wanted to give you mercy. I, when I get into the timelines in the morning service, I'm going to show you Daniel's 70 weeks and show you the different things. Because Daniel said 70 weeks of years are determined upon my people or 490 years. And I said, God, why 70 times 7? He said, because a man must forgive until 70 times 7. In other words, he's giving them every opportunity to receive their Messiah. But they would not. Therefore, he says, he wept and he said, your house is left to you desolate. And all of the woes are going to come on this generation. And then he goes in Matthew 24 and starts the great prophecy. Wherefore, he starts out in Matthew 24. Verily I say unto you, bring me up Matthew 24 if you would. Just bring up the whole chapter for right now. I, I'm only... Matthew 24. While they're bringing that up, let me, go, let me jump way ahead to verse 34 in here because while I'm, I'm here to connect the thought, once again he's saying to them, I wanted to gather you. I wanted to give you mercy. I've, I sent prophets, 
I sent servants. Some of them you stoned, others you killed. And a few verses above this, he gives an incredible parable. He said a certain man had a vineyard, he let it out to husbandmen. And then he sent the servants to see how the vineyard is doing. Some of them they killed, others they sent, uh, killed, stoned. Last but not least, he said, I'll send my son. Surely they'll receive the son of the owner of the vineyard. But they killed the son of the owner of the vineyard. What do you think the owner of the vineyard is going to do to those wicked husbandmen? He's, go he's going to burn their city, is what he says, and that he's going to give the vineyard to a people producing the fruit. And then Jesus begins to prophesy to these people, I wanted to gather you. In other words, I have given you every opportunity. I've given you 70 times 7. And not only did I send prophets, he sent the son of the owner of the vineyard. And they have now rejected the owner of the vineyard. And Jesus says that all of these woes will come upon this generation. How many know he's talking about those people standing right there? The reason I'm showing you that is because it uses this same Greek, this same word, English word and Greek word in Matthew 24. After Jesus gave, gives the great prophecy of great tribulation and the end of the world, he tells them because he, they ask him, he said, when he walks up to Matthew 24, verse number one, go ahead and bring that up if you got it. Can you do that? And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So he's standing there looking at the beautiful buildings of the temple. Next verse. And Jesus said to them, See you not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Next verse. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the King James world, every other translation, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Game changer. I hope you can go home tonight with a lot of fear going. Listen, man, I can remember crying myself to sleep after seeing a lot of those movies and think, man, I can, I can remember coming home from school one day and my mom and dad were gone. Nobody was home in my house. I thought, I have been left behind. I tried to call my grandmama on the phone because I knew if she was home, I was still safe. I couldn't get my grandmama on the phone. I was crying out to Jesus because I thought the moon was red the night before that. This is the big one, Myrtle. I have been left behind. And you will be surprised, the people today, right now. And the reason I really think that this is really gaining traction, I, if I told you, I won't say it because of the videos, but if I told you some of the leaders I am meeting with behind the scene, it would astound you that they know what, I, that, that I have heads, of, heads of denominations have told me, I believe what you're teaching is true. But if we preach it, the people will leave. I just refuse to lie to people. I want to preach the truth. And you got to do whatever you want to with it. You, you can eat the grapes and spit out the seeds, but for the life of me, I can't understand why anybody would not at least grasp the possibility that the outcome of this might be a whole lot better than we thought it would be. And that these catastrophes that we keep on reading from Matthew 24 that we think are going to come very shortly upon us are actually not coming to us at all. That Jesus answered the question, when will this happen? He answers that question. Verse 34, Matthew 24. This generation will not pass away. Matthew 24, 34. This generation will not pass away until everything I told you comes to pass. That includes tribulation such as was not. That includes the sun being darkened, the moon being turned into blood. That includes famine and war and catastrophe. All of that he said would happen before that generation, alive and well, passed off the scene. Somebody challenged me with that and said, well, you know, it's the generation that sees the budding of the fig tree. I said, if you're going to put the context, you've got to put the context here. What did he say in chapter 23? 
that all of these woes he just prophesied, it would come upon them that killed the prophets, stone them that sent them, would come on this generation. If that was the generation he was talking to right there, he didn't change the word when he got over here. Just because it don't meet our theology. See, I don't know why this wouldn't make you want to run the aisles. There's the possibility that you may not have seven years of hell on earth to look forward to. Yeah, but Brother House, can't you see we're about in great tribulation? Yeah. When one of our three Lexuses ain't running right, we think the end of the world's near. We, we have a 21st century paradigm. And if you just, I, I love to watch stuff about history. And I look back even at the founding of this nation and some of the rough stuff that people, world wars, World War I, World War II, all the different times that they saw. Down through history, even every time there was a pandemic, they started crying, this is the end, God is judging the world, this is the end, the end is near. And they started drawing on, and as a matter of fact, it was like 400 some years after this period of time that they first started to interpret the book of Revelation as something being in the future. And they started to grab that to say, hey, the stars have aligned. This, 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 this virus is, is the judgment of God, and this is a sign that's the end of the world. Well, whoops. Come on, somebody. I mean, I, I, I literally have historic documents of, of all of the stuff down through history where they thought the end was near and it never came to pass. In the 1500s, they had the Black Plague, and then Luther comes on the scene and starts to lead a reformation right in the middle of a pandemic. And the first time we get a virus, well, these are the signs of the book of Revelation. They're not the signs of the book of Revelation. Those things occur just like Jesus said they would, including the sun being darkened, the moon being turned into blood, and the stars falling from heaven. Because what happens many times is people challenge me with that. And I say, well, you need to understand prophetic language. Because when Joseph had his dream, he saw the sun, the moon, and the stars bow down to him. He knew that those were symbols of natural Israel and the powers of the heavens. And what he was saying is what's about to be shaken is that the, you're not going to go out here tomorrow and the sun fall out of the sky and the moon not be up there. He was talking about the removal of old covenant Israel and he was talking about the sun being dark and the moon being turned into blood and the stars falling from heaven. Even as a fig tree, which is another symbol of natural Israel, is shaken by a mighty wind and the wind that blew, blew on the day of Pentecost and it was gone with the wind. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some very real problems that are in our world. But, you know, I just, met a, I just read a book called Why You've Been Duped Into Thinking the World's Getting Worse and Worse. And this guy originally started out as a news reporter. And he was writing this book not as a, as a uh, I don't think as a, as a Christian book, but he was showing statistics. I hope it don't offend you if I tell you the world is getting better. I'll try that over here. See, see we, we've, got, we've got this worldview that's messed up. And, and, and as a result, we have, we have this view of God that's messed up. We have, we have a losing Jesus on our hands who, who can't hardly get us through the next couple of days. I mean, listen, I think that especially anybody that's been raised in word of faith, you've been taught the authority of the believer, except we think all that means is whoever dies with the most stuff wins. No, 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 we're supposed to use this faith to bring about some change in God's world. To begin to speak authority and begin to pull down principalities and powers and stuff like that. Are you all following me? Does that sound too grand for you? I, you know, listen, uh, you know, here, here's how I feel about that. If I am wrong and, and Jesus comes tonight and splits the eastern sky, man, I'm out of here with you. And I'll stand before him because I'm saved. And it don't determine whether I'm going to heaven or not. But I'll stand before him and say, well, I'm sorry I just preached you so big. I just thought you were bigger than that, so I'm sorry I preached you so big. I hope you're not disappointing me, my Lord, for preaching you so big. Because it's amazing to me, the bigger I preach God, the matter people get. You preach a great big God, a wee little defeated devil, and people look at you like, what rock did you crawl out from underneath of? And, the, you know, as I started looking at these statistics that this guy gave, he said, you know what, there's actually less war in the world than there's ever been. And I thought, well, I don't know if that's true. That's because we got 24-7 news. Yeah. And this guy was a newscaster, and he said, here's what we said. When we started a news program, if it bleeds, it leads. Because as long as we can shock you and keep you glued to it, even in the middle of COVID, 
I don't want to get political here. But in the middle of COVID, they were showing pictures of mass graves in Brazil. In Brasilia, Brazil, where I preach. They were showing bulldozers putting mass graves. I called the pastor that I know that I preach for there. I said, I said Gabriel, they are showing mass graves in, 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 in Brazil. Is that happening in your city? Because that was they were saying. He said, brother, that's not even here. That's, that's, they're showing you loops from Italy. He said, we're, we're not having any worse than anybody else is. I mean, people got COVID, but they're, they're recovering. But if it bleeds, it leads. And then the church jumps on that. It's like, see here, these are the signs. No, no, see, the signs that he said, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, you're going to know that it's near even at the door. And can I tell you, in 66 AD, when the Roman general sieged the cities of Jerusalem, 37 years after Jesus gave, or 36 years, some more approximately there, after Jesus gave this prophecy, that every believer that heard Jesus prophesy in Matthew 24, that this is the sign when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, you better get out of Dodge, let him that's in Jerusalem flee to the mountains, and pray that your flight be not on the winter or on the Sabbath. That he's not talking about your flight out of here in the sky. He's talking about your fleeing and leaving. And pray that it's not in, that you're not with child and they're pregnant and all that. You know, we, We've been scared to death. Well, bless God, I'm going to be left behind and we'll be able to buy milk for the babies. I'm telling you, what's the babies doing here if that's the case? They should have went on the first load. Help me a little bit. I mean, we we and, 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 but what he said. But when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, and every person that heard Jesus prophesy this and believed it, fled Jerusalem and went to a place called Pella for forty-two months, times, times and a half, times three and a half years. While the city was being destroyed and not one believer was destroyed in the siege of Jerusalem because they believed the prophecy of Jesus was imminent to their generation, just like he said, these things will happen in this generation. I'm trying to tell you that what he prophesied about tribulation and great tribulation was not something that's out in our distant future, that the moment we get the right sign that we think the end is near, that this begins it. Let me tell you something. I'm not trying to be facetious tonight, but at some point we got to, we, we've been through all the blood moons and the Jerusalem countdowns. I'm not trying to be facetious, but I, I mean, I've been through the late great planet Earth and the, the Left Behind series, and, I, you know, and I'm just trying to say, just consider the possibility that since a lot of that didn't pan out, that maybe there's a victorious eschatology. And, and, you know, it's going to be probably Sunday before I get into what I think is going to happen in the future. But I can tell you this. I do know the end uh, of what God is purposing is not the end or a global catastrophe. The end is more than a time period. It's a person. He's the alpha. He'll be the omega. He's the first. He'll be the last. And it's his purpose to bring all things and gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In other words, he's trying to gather people into himself because God so loved the world. Does that make sense to you? In that book that the guy had, he said there was less disease in the world than there's ever been. Listen to me. In my lifetime, let me see what time it is. In my lifetime, polio has been eradicated. Hoop and cough, smallpox. Well, if you go to Atlanta and you come up out of the tunnel in Atlanta, there's a sign that says when this airport was built in 1957, the life expectancy of the American male was 57 years old. But since this airport has been built, the life expectancy of the American male is somewhere around 85. Anybody over 57 besides me? Lift your hand. Under that old paradigm, tick tock. I'm 65, living on borrowed time. Y'all don't want to help me preach it here. We're living longer. I'm, I'm sorry if good news shocks you. We are actually the first generation who lives long enough to die from cancer. Now, that's not a good thing. I'm just saying we're living longer. I have a mother-in-law who's 91. I buried a pastor friend of mine last year who was 103 and a half when she died. She still wore makeup, high heels, and preached the gospel. Was John and Ann Jimenez's pastor actually got John Jimenez off the street when he was a drug addict? 
Preached for her when I was 16 years old, 103. Drove her own car. Hallelujah. We're living longer. Touch somebody said, that's some good news right there. Less war, less disease. I know there's some real problems in our world, but see, I think a whole lot of our problems really sometimes can stem around a lot of bad theology because what we believe affects people. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to give myself legitimacy, but I have literally been to Washington to meet with presidents over some of the stuff I teach. Signed a book that's back there on the table in the middle of an Iraqi war. To, to a, a president who said to me, you mean to tell me that this is not Armageddon? I said, that's exactly what I'm saying to you, is that this is not the end. Come on, somebody. And he said, these other preachers are crying, the sky is falling, but this guy's got some answers and Washington's out of answers. Can you hear what I'm saying? Now, I'm a country boy. I don't mean that by dropping names. I'm just trying to tell you, I'm a country boy that wrote a book that got somehow got in the hands of a commander in chief that said there might be an alternative to pushing the red button. What we believe matters. Hallelujah. And he's talking about here that, you know, again, tribulation. I won't go down through all Matthew 24. You know all these verses. There'll be tribulation such as was not since the world began or will ever be again. In other words, that tribulation that was about to come upon all the world. And then when he said that this would happen before this generation would pass away, and they said, where, Lord? He said, wherever the carcass is, that's where the vultures will be gathered together, and it never dawns on us that the banner and the spear on the Roman soldier when they siege the city of Jerusalem was that of a Roman spear. With the Roman, it was a banner on the... They literally were su surrounded with vultures just like Jesus prophesied. It came to pass within the same 40-year period that He told Him it would come to pass. Jesus did not fail in His prophecy it came to pass exactly like he said. You cannot use that any longer to trip our kids up and say the Bible can't be trusted because Jesus was wrong. We just have to reinterpret how we see some things and interpret it in the light of what Jesus was really saying and quit trying to put a 21st century mindset on a book that was written to people who understood the covenants and what was taking place and they knew that, come on, something was radically about to shift and change here and that the end was upon them. Now let me give you a few more scriptures and I'm going to get out of your road for tonight. But uh, let, let me, Matthew 16, just give you, I'm giving you several of these. Matthew 16, verse 27 and 28 says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which will not taste death till see, they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Not my opinion. What saith the Word of God? He's talking to his audience. He said, there's some of you standing right here who will not taste death. So you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. First century stuff. Luke 21, 22, 22, 28 says, For these shall be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written might be fulfilled. This is Luke 21. That's his version of the Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. That all these things which are written might be fulfilled. But woe to them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. There shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Forty-two months, Revelation 11, the Gentiles sieged the city and it was given to them to tread the city under 42 months happened at the end of that 40-year transition period, the last three and a half years, times, times, and a half of times. Then shall there be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Let me say this as well, because I want to hit this first here above it where it talks about, it says that they will be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles Oh, um, no, verse, verse 23 is one of them. But woe unto them that are with child, them that give suck in those days. But there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. I want to make this comment. I hope I'm not wearing you out. Are you still okay? Some of you know my aunt and Uncle Bob and Linda. You know, now they, they're going to Ber they live in Berkeley Springs now, so they, they now attend our church. But Linda told me the first time she ever heard me teach this, she said, you know why we only had one child? I said, no, I don't, Linda. She said, because of that scripture. 
will those who are with child and them that give suck in those days. And she said, it robbed me of a family. A scripture out of context robbed her of, are y'all, y'all hearing what I'm saying? A lot of people right now say, I don't know if I want to bring kids into this kind of a world. You're the ones that ought to be bringing them into the world. Well, hallelujah. Let, let me give you another one that's along, along that same line that I, I think is 1 Corinthians 7, 29. I know I'm probably giving you some of these out of context here, but 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29 through 31 said, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that they, both they that have wives, be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world is passing away. And another place it tells Paul tells him, if you're not married, don't seek a wife. And if you've got a wife, don't get rid of her. But the time is short. I taught this in Tulsa. And uh, two, uh, two older people come up to my table after, after the seminar. And when she was 75, I believe he was 74. Tears running down their faces. And she looked at me and she said, this is my brother. And she said, I'm his sister. Neither one of us have ever been married. Neither one of us have any kids, no grandchildren. She said, you know why, Dr. House? I said, no, I don't. She said, because of that scripture. A scripture out of context, not written to me, robbed me of a family. And with tears running down her face, she said, don't let another person be robbed of their future. My children today, let's see, this is what floats my boat. I could care less about fame or being on TV or any of the stuff that I've done. But when I look at my own family and I realize that I preached something that gave them back their future and their dreams. That my daughter-in-law is a doctor today because I said, go to school, you've got time. You've got a future. So, so I have one daughter-in-law that's a doctor, one that's a chiropractic doctor. My son's both pastor. And, and what I'm saying is that our church is full of young people who didn't forfeit their future because of some bad theology that robbed them of their dreams. There's some of us probably sitting here. And when I was in, I know I'm being lengthy, but let me, let me just flow. I, I was when, in, in the 70s, it was a sin to wear shorts to take physical education in high school. So we went to opt out of physical education because it was a sin to wear shorts to play physical education. And my principal looked across the table and he said, listen, he said, I, I respect your religious beliefs, but I can't give you a diploma without at least two credits of physical education. My pastor looked across the table and he said, you don't need an education. You'll never see the end of the 70s. Jesus will be back. There are preachers today who opted out of Social Security and didn't put nothing away for retirement because they believed the end was imminent. Now they don't have Medicare, Social Security, or any retirement. In 1988, when there was 88 reasons why Jesus would come in 1988, I knew a man in Alabama had to get the sheriff to get him off the roof because... He was waiting on Jesus to return. They told him it would happen in September of 1988. And when the sheriff finally brought him down off the roof, he was quoting the scripture, let him that's on the roof not, not come down and take anything out of his house. Wrong timing and wrong theology is dangerous because it robs us of our future. Am I making any sense to you all tonight? But when we start to see that, well, maybe what we need to be doing is raising children who are going to engage our culture, maybe be in political stuff. Maybe we, God knows we need some godly people in entertainment right now. We need it in music. I, I, I hope this is not offensive. As a matter of fact, I wished, to, wished him happy birthday yesterday, but there's a young boy, he's not young anymore, but whenever I first met him, his feet wouldn't even touch the, the pedals on the Hammond B3 organ. He played the organ for his daddy in a great church in Moorhead City, North Carolina. And he now plays backup music for Harry Connick Jr. And I think it's for uh, McDonald. Uh, and he plays it for all these guests. He plays backup music, but he flies home every Sunday morning to play that organ. And has never given up his faith. He's hit infected. In other words, he has been effective to share. Are y'all, y'all tracking with me? 
See, I think what God's looking for is godly people in positions. A, a, a young man who played football that grew up in the church in Cedartown just signed a multi-million dollar contract with the uh, Cleveland Browns. In other words, what, what are you saying? I'm trying to tell you that we can give them back their future and maybe really make a difference in our world if we'll stop waiting on evacuation and start to occupy. And if we're wrong, at least we did everything we could do. Well, help me, Holy Ghost. I'm just trying to show you that these scriptures are all stuff that's been pulled out of context, not written to us, that have made people forfeit their future. Let me just go quickly through these. Romans, uh, let me see. Let me go back up here real quick. And, and uh, I've covered most of them, I think, fairly good. Let me just, First Peter 4, verse 7, said, But the end of all things is at hand. Be the first sober. Watch under prayer. Luke 21, 31, 32 says, So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass away till all be fulfilled. Romans 13, verse 11, And that knowing the time that is now high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The context of the scripture is not talking about somewhere out in the future. He was talking about our redemption drawing nigh. Your redemption drawing nigh is not your flight to glory. It is the redemption from the curse of the law that you received under the new covenant. It was a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, and Jesus revealed that salvation to us. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 says, But this I say, brethren, that the time is short. It remaineth that they that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and that they would buy that though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world is passing away. Here's one of my favorite end of the world scriptures, Hebrews 9, verse 26. It says, For once he, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end, King James says, in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. But again, the correct translation, this is my favorite end of the world scripture. And uh, Hallelujah. He hath appeared once in the end of the world. I'm simply trying to show you that every place you see this word world, check it out. Because not every word in the Greek is world global. It's talking about the age. It was the end of that age. And that's a game changer. Matthew 13, the, the sower went forth to sow. He sowed good seed in his field while men slept. An enemy came and sowed tares. He said, but we'll let them both grow together until the harvest. And the harvest, Matthew 13, King James' old version says, the harvest is the end of the world. King James, New King James and every other translation that now corrects it correctly, the harvest is the end of the age, not the end of this age. It was the harvest of that age. That doesn't mean God's not still reaping the vine of the earth. It just means that was what he was talking about. And they gathered together in bundles what was good, and the rest of it was burnt with an unquenchable fire. Many of these parables will make sense to you when you start to come down through there and you start to realize he's talking to that audience. Are you, are you tracking with me? I, I, there's so much I could say there, but I think I'll... Uh, here's Hebrews 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that will come will come and will not tarry. Now the just will live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But you are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but unto them that believe to the saving of the soul. He's writing to Hebrews who are wanting to go back to Judaism, and he's saying, don't go back. We are them who don't draw back were them who believed to the saving of the soul. But when he says, in yet a little while, and he that will come, will come and will not tarry, is a direct quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He said, for the vision is yet for appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just will live by faith. That was a direct quote. He calls it an it, a vision, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will come, and it will come in the latter days. But what happens is in Hebrews, he said, yet a little while, and he that will come, will come. It's not an it any longer. It's a he. And how many know he did come, and he did redeem us from the curse of the law, and bring us into the new covenant. Revelation, or 
1 Peter 4, 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be sober. Revelation 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Not 2,020 some years and counting. And he sent and signified it unto his angel. Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy keep those things which are written in, for the time is at hand. Revelation 22, verse 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Revelation 22, 10, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Contrast that with what he said to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 when he said to Daniel, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. But in Revelation, he tells Daniel, Seal up your book, for the time is for the distant future. But he tells John, Don't seal yours up because the time is at hand. He which testified these things, Revelation 20, verse 20 and 21, said, He which testified these things, say, Surely I come quickly, even, amen, even so. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let me kind of make some concluding remarks, and then we'll get out of the road just for a second. All I'm trying to establish tonight is the possibility that the last days are past days. That it's not the end of the world globe, it's the end of the age. End of what age? Old covenant age. What I'm trying to establish tonight is a lot of stuff that we thought was coming is not coming at all. That ought to be incredibly good news. That you may not have to look for hell on earth to come. I really think we're in a great awakening right now. I, 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 like I said, I, I could go back and just preach a whole thing on uh, viruses and victories that we sent out a message back some time ago. But every time there's been a pandemic, every single time in human history, many times they thought the end was near and they thought it was a last day revival. It was not a last day revival. It was God restoring some piece of truth back to the church. I think what God is restoring back to the church right now is a dominion theology and the authority of the believer and the power of the Holy Spirit and a church that's awakening to the fact that we're going to engage some stuff. We're here for a purpose. And if we're not the salt and the light, we're in real trouble. But I believe that there are people just like you that will show up on a Friday night and say, wait wait a minute, mate, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe there's some stuff God has put in me that were God dreams. Maybe I've been called. Maybe, maybe God could use me in a political arena, in an entertainer, in a business arena, because it takes all of that. Because, see, there's so much I could say to you. I, I will say this. You know, when I got invited to Washington, when I wrote this book, I got invited to a full-blown presidential dinner as a guest of the president with a request to sign five books that night. One to George Bush, the second two, one to John McCain, one to Sarah Palin, one to Congressman Zach Womp, and one to Karl Rove i got to tell you, I've signed a lot of books, but my hand was shaking when I signed one to the commander-in-chief. And when I sat there in this presidential dinner, I, t I took a lesson on which fork to use because I'm a country boy. Seriously. You know, knock the mashed potatoes off of that, it'll work for the cake. Full-blown black tie affair. And I leaned over. I've sat, we were sitting real, real close to the president because we were invited guests. Entertainment was, you know, famous people and congressmen and world leaders were there all over this room. And I leaned over because my wife was with me and another pastor and his wife was with me. And the uh, guy who actually got the book in the hand of Carl Rove was there. And uh, he, he, he was sitting with us. And he, I, I leaned over to the pastor. I said, I said I, I, I'm a little overwhelmed. I said, some of the most powerful people in the world are in this room. He looked over at me, he said, and we're two of them. I said, thank you for the reminder. He looked at me, he said, and we're two of them, Mr. Ambassador. I got my papers with me. And it says, in my copy of my papers that were ministers of reconciliation. 
to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that he's made us ambassadors of the kingdom of God with delegated authority to operate the business of the kingdom and the business of the king, and we are to be salt and light. And let me say this to you. I don't know whether I had an effect on any of the decisions they made, but what I'm simply saying is this. I would have never dreamed something like that would happen to a country boy. Our, our, our town literally did a, a, a news story on it because up till then they thought we were the cult out on the hill. You, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because when I look over this room and I, I see this young man sitting here and I think full of kingdom purpose and potential. You got a future, man. I look at the people here and think we are, we are agents of change. We can bring change in the world by being the salt and the light. If we'll quit crying, the sky is falling. And that's all I'm going to tonight is just to give you those is that the last days might possibly be the past days. And all I'm asking you to do is consider that possibility. As Gavin is getting ready to come, let me say very quickly that we have with us some of our books and stuff back there. We have a book I wrote on Revelation. It's the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. It's back there and available. But we, what, what we have, there's no way I'm going to exhaust this subject. But there are some thumb drives or jump drives that are fully loaded with MP3 audio files. A hundred, I believe there's 134 30-minute segments of teaching that are used in several Bible colleges right now. And that, that jump drive with 134 messages that is it's, it's chapter by chapter of the book of Revelation is 100 bucks. It's back on the table. That is our number one seller, bar none, of all times. People are requesting that all over the place. And I thought when I started teaching this on national TV like I'm teaching, I figured it would be my death warrant. I figured, but I, you know what? When you turn 65, you start saying, I don't have time to preach cute little sermons anymore. I'm either going to say something or I'm going home. And when I started teaching this on national TV, our ratings shot out the roof, and all of a sudden we started to pick up partners that said, we can get behind something like this. Because this is not crying the sky is falling. He's a great big God.